Alrighty, so there you have it. Good morning. It's been a while since I ran this series, uh, the Decoding the Days of Noah. And today we have a very interesting topic, I must admit, and it's quiet, deep. For those of you who've not been following this series, I haven't done it for a while. It's been a very busy period, and because of how busy it's been, it's been very challenging to get the topic uh, done. As you know, I have to carry out tons of research to get this right. And so many times because of that, I take uh, a bit of time and get things in order. And then also, if you notice, I didn't do an announcement uh, concerning the, the, the presentation itself in terms of a post before. I usually do that, but unfortunately I couldn't. So I apologize. So let me very quickly, for the sake of those who have never followed Days of Noah, this, this series is born or was born because of what happened uh, this year. Was it this year or was it last year? Now, last year, December, but this year in May, when the Pentagon, America's most um, powerful military uh, platform, released information very interesting information which most people missed. They released information confirming the existence of uh, unidentified flying objects better known as UFOs. And they admitted some crazy serious stuff. I mean, it's so serious that any person that is worth their salt, anybody that's interested in what the prophecies Jesus gave concerning the end times is, would take that as a massive red flag, a real warning about the times we're in. And what made that interesting for me is what it was able to tie in with the Olivet Discourse. This is the, the, the prophecy that Jesus gave when he was asked by his disciples, Lord, tell us about the time that you're coming and what we're going to see. Now, in Luke chapter 17, there's something very interesting with that passage, which I love so much. Jesus actually said, and uh, I quote, as it was in the days of Noah, and then he also spoke about the days of Lot. So he gave two very distinct pictures there. So what happened in the days of Lot? I've always told you this. He spoke of the transgender agenda because in that era, we saw the rise of sodomy and all manner of uh, that kind of behavior in that city, uh, the two cities actually, so the twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah. And these two led to the great um, uh, destruction of those cities. Then what happened in the days of Noah, we saw the rise of, um, of the, the, the watchers, the fallen angels. They, they came on earth and they made a deal with men and they began to pro to procreate with human beings. And there's a, there's a whole school that argues with this whole view about the procreation of man. But I tackled it thoroughly and I demonstrated clearly that there's absolutely no way in which procreation could take place um, uh, between human beings of the same species and produce giants because the giants are inexplicable. Now, some argue and say, no, it meant giant in reputation, but nah, the Bible doesn't speak in parables over obvious things. So when, when, when it described uh, Goliath and his brothers, they were giants. When it described Og, the king of Bashan, he was a giant. When it described these men of renown in Genesis chapter 6, they were, they were giants. They were not just normal people. They were massive you know, human beings of massive stature. And so the Bible tells us clearly that they were hybrids. They were not normal human beings. And I do go deep into describing. In fact, I did go quite a bit into describing the implications of the image of these creatures and the whole tie around the very DNA of man. So we, we spoke about the fearful sights Jesus spoke about. We then looked at the whole project, Blue Book, its history, and what that was about. Then we went into what I'm calling the speculated deception. I have been on the speculated deception for the last couple of series. The first one was the great lie. And uh, this great lie started in the Garden of Eden uh, when uh, the serpent lied to 
Adam and of course through his wife that they would live forever and they would be like God knowing good and evil and all manner of things and you know it was the appeal of knowledge that that sucked in Adam and Eve and we, we kind of hinted on what the serpent is very interesting and then we went to the great setup now I've been on the great setup so on the great setup we began with a with a breakdown what was that setup so we we studied a bit of the book of Enoch it's not a Bible book but it has massive insight and because of its historical significance you know the book of Enoch is very similar to the books of Maccabees or or the books of Jubilee or the book of Jasher. You know, these are books that are referred to in scripture, but they don't come under our canon of scripture. Now, just because they don't come under the canon of scripture doesn't mean that the content is completely useless. You find that there's a lot of aspects in there that give a historical view of what was going on. And for me, I find the book of Enoch very, very interesting in that regard. It, it, is, a, it is a book that actually showcases in very profound ways some of the things that we fail to understand uh, when you look at Genesis chapter 6. In fact, it is my view, I posit, just like many others who've studied the book, that the writings of the book of Enoch were supplementary to the book of Genesis. I believe that the author of the book of Genesis was aware of how everybody from that era was familiar with Enoch's writings. And remember, Enoch is mentioned in Genesis chapter 5 as a man that walked with God, and because he was so righteous and so different, he was taken away. He never tasted death. So it's a very interesting thing, yet he left these write-ups. Now, obviously, you know, all these holy and right, um, so all these historical writings being what they are, the first book of Enoch is the one that is most, I think, tieable to the doctrine and teachings of the Jews. Whereas the second book of Enoch and the third book of Enoch are authored long after uh, the church is in existence. And so they have questionable background. And when you read them, you realize that they go deeply into Gnostic teaching, which you know very well. Well, maybe you don't know. But for me, as a student of these things, I know what Gnostic teaching looks like when I see it. So, so it goes deep into Gnostic teaching and of course those who are students of uh, bibliography and all manner of writings can tell you with certainty that the book is attributed to Enoch but it's certainly not authored by him. It was authored by some Jewish rabbis in the first part of the first millennium and then the, the third book of Enoch also the same. So we know the real book of Enoch, Enoch 1, is the one that's found in the Ethiopian Coptic Bible. Uh, so that Coptic Bible has the book of Enoch, and that's where most people sourced the full complete version of that book. You also find it, of course, in Slavic Bible, uh, author, um, Russian Orthodox Bibles. There are a number of Bibles that kind of went uh, under the radar of the, of the Mother Church, so they kind of remained as they were with all the other extra biblical material in there. But it's during the... The 300 AD work that brought about the canon as we know it, that a lot of work was done. And books like Enoch were pretty much just taken out. They, they weren't even kept in there, they were taken out. And I have my reasons. I do touch on that a little bit. But then we also looked, so, so, the, so the setup is that um, there are things that are taught in the book of Enoch that would be too revealing considering where the mother church and the infiltration of the mother church came in. So the, the, the people that were part of that setup did not want that information out there. So we've got the great setup. We also have, I, I did dig deep into the mother God. Okay, the mother God, we went deep into that. That's one of the greatest setups of of, of the church era ever. In fact, mankind in general, the mother God, mother teaching, very scary, very profound. Mother goddess, earth goddess, divine feminist. I do a great, great, uh, I did a great, you know, teaching around that. And then we looked also at the dark trinity and we spoke about that. So I dealt with the Nimrod, the sun god, Semiramis or Ishtar, the moon god, also the mother god and Tammuz or Dumuzid. So we did a 
deep study up around the what we call the dark trinity something that was also sneaked into the into christendom and you know uh, for the sake of those that are not familiar, I think it's extremely important that uh, you remember that in the book of 1 John chapter 2, verse 18 to 20, John the Revelator clearly states that the Antichrist and the spirit of the Antichrist is already upon the earth. And he is already out there at work. And so even within the church, there are those who came in with the spirit of Antichrist and launched out. They claim to be of the church, but they were not of the church. So they came from us, but they are not of us. And I think that's a very important thing to state because over the next 1,500 years, essentially the mother church did extensive work through these imposters to bring about another gospel. It's amazing that this thing caught on and you know the mother church was very powerful so it was at the it was at the hand of death they they killed they they basically silenced with death and power anyone that opposed the church so of course we know in the 1500s you had the reformation and that brought about a totally different thing but meantime i speak about the strange fire as well to kind of show you this merging of the sacred with the, with the profane and, 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 and how that went on in the church. So today, I just want to quickly jump, of course, I also shouldn't forget, I spoke very powerfully and taught about the, the serpentine spirit. I spoke about the uh, cone-shaped uh, pineal gland and how that was working, spirit of divination, the story of Acts 16. These are all examples of how these things have woven themselves into the church and many are not aware. And now you see with the charismatic movement, we have what is called the spirit of Kundalini very powerfully at work. Now all these are part of the great setup because you see, you've got to understand that in the end time, whatever that end time is, the enemy has got a multifaceted, multi-pronged approach to the deception of the world. That's why the Bible says it will be the great lie. And that's why I call it, you know, the great lie, the great setup. Now, these two are going to make sure that the majority will miss it. I, it's only by the grace of God and obedience that the few will find it. It's, it's scary to say, and this, but it's true. And so that's why even now, um, as I delve into this part, I'll, I'll try and be brief with it. Because in the next episode, we're going to be looking at the great master reset itself. So as we delve into this, we're going to deal with what I'm calling Atlantis Reborn, the land of the plumed serpent. I'm going to show you how in this day and age, what you and I know as the United States is one of the greatest tools that was permeated by the enemy to use to set up that end time rise of that great city from ancient times called Atlantis. Now, I'm not going to go into the whole Atlantean mythology because that will be beyond the scope of this teaching. But I'm going to tell you this. If you study the book of, um, sorry, if you study the whole fall of uh, what went on before the deluge, you'll understand that in the ancient civilization, specifically Mesopotamia, Arcadia, Sumerian, and Egyptian. Well, now nah, because Greece didn't exist. Greece came much later. These are really ancient cities and they existed and have mythology which is absolutely amazing. In their mythology, you learn something profound. You learn that there is the existence of this, these half God, half human beings. And they take on various cities. And one of the most famous cities mythology teaches is Atlantis. And it is said that Atlantis was buried by a flood. Everybody knows that. And, and there's been all this hunt for ancient Atlantis. What made Atlantis so powerful? It is said that it was literally uh, given as a city by the gods, specifically Zeus, to one of his sons. And they began to son or daughter, I can't remember, I'm not really a student of mythology, but they started to rule from there, and this became a great city. 
If you study that city, you start to see what we call out-of-place artifacts. You start to see technology that technically should have been beyond these people. I mean, one characteristic trait you pick in all ancient civilizations is this greatly advanced level of technology. Greatly advanced levels of technology. I mean, if you don't know this, for example, the Sanskrit writings, which is where you get the Bhagavad Gita and all these ancient Hindu writings, you learn with absolute shock of warfare. You learn about craft that fly. I mean, this is written in books that are four to 5,000 years old. In fact, that's an understatement, 6,000 years old. So we're talking about three to, three to 4,000 BC. Okay, and they talk about ships. They talk about vessels that go in the air and fly around. Now, you remember these are ancient people, so they are trying to describe something that they didn't have the appropriate words for. So they describe using words which sometimes even for us in this day and age is difficult to decipher. You've got drawings that show you that they would actually fight and they would shoot uh, fire. And this fire would be so destructive, it would destroy everything. In fact, a lot of historians posit uh, that... Um, or maybe call them pseudo-historians, but historians nonetheless posit that these describe nuclear warfare. Now that's amazing. Nuclear warfare 6,000 years ago? And like how? You see? And one thing that is so clear, that is so interesting, when you go into scripture and you study scripture, there is a timeline that I sat and watched and looked at and it blew my mind. I'm going to show, ask you something. Look at the technology we have today. And this, this is deep because I want to show you how Ecclesiastes chapter 1, which speaks about the things of ancient and now, and whatever you see now is not new. I want to show you this by using a timeline example. Did you know that between Adam to Noah, there is over 2,600 years? Did you know that? I was shocked. 2,600 years. Now, if you want to understand 2,600 years for human beings, I want you to go back in history right now, our so-called history, and I really look at our history with a lot of suspicion. But go back to our history right now. Look at our technology today. How long has it taken humanity to reach this level of technology where I can speak to you on a phone like this and you can catch me on the internet and... We so apologies about that. You know, internet can be a bit of a pain. So let's go back to my point. How many cases do you know of, uh, think about it, this technology we have today, how many years has it taken us to develop it? Think about it, right? Right from the so-called Bronze Age. Let's go all the way back to the Stone Age. How long has it taken man to develop to this level? Um, if you do a, a, a cursory study, it will show you that the last 400 years is when we have had this massive growth. Yet, between the time of Adam to the time of Lamech and Noah, we've got 2,600 years. What makes you think that in 2,600 years, man would not have developed very astounding technology in that period? What makes you and I think our era is superior to the era of the ancients? That's why you go to ancient civilizations and you find very strange artifacts. You find very strange things that are not, they don't suit to be in that time, but they're there. And so what I'm trying to tell you is that the whole idea of Atlantis and that advanced technology they had at the time, which, by the way, was given explicitly by the watchers, who are angels that rebelled against God, had all manner of knowledge, and they taught this knowledge to human beings. That's the knowledge that they used to create amazing things in their time. Okay? So you start to see that the 2,600 years that man existed until the deluge, man had advanced immensely. And that's why God literally had to come in and intervene. And I'm going to show you in subsequent episodes exactly what that thing was that happened that caused God to come in and obliterate humanity. 
and I'll show you the relation. So let's go back to Atlantis. So the, when Atlantis fell, the, the, the knowledge and things about Atlantis and the, and the things that were shared by the fallen angels and the information that kept being taught Gnostically, hidden, through the hidden occult, was to re-establish Atlantis. And you see, this is the one thing I want now to kind of bring it in together now. They needed to re-establish Atlantis. And how was the re-establishment of, of Atlantis going to happen? It was going to happen by bringing back all the things that made Atlantis such a powerful place. So in the Gnostic teachings, these are teachings that were secretly passed on from those ancient days. You, you and I call it the occult, but this is alternative knowledge, hidden knowledge, because it's secret knowledge, taught by who? Taught by the God of this age, Lucifer himself, through those angels. Now many were bound. But there are some that will be released. There are some that move around even now. And they work to bring about the establishment of that kingdom. Where did it all begin? Let's go to America now and really quickly show this. America, from the word go, was dubbed to become the new Atlantis. And if you want to understand Atlantis well, you've got to go to Revelation. Sorry about it, guys. You know, internet has been very funny. So like I was saying... If you study the whole book of Revelation 17, you come across a great city and, of course, the great whore, which is Babylon the Great. But you understand that Babylon the Great and the apostate church, which is what she represents, also happens to be a great merchant city called Babylon. And that merchant city becomes the greatest source of commerce and success in the world. And that city is the city that contends against God. And I'm going to show you that the rise of Atlantis in this era and Babylon are no different. These are just different names of the same thing. Babylon goes on to be a great place of commerce, a great place of success. And in my next one, I'm really going to go deeper into that. But I just want to show you very quickly how this all ties up. You must understand that when, back in the day, this is in the 1500s, 1600s, during the Reformation, as uh, the, what's it called, the, what's it called now, the Renaissance was coming about, there are great individuals that arose. And one of the greatest individuals I can think of in that era was a man called Francis Bacon. Now, Francis Bacon was one of the aristocrats from uh, the UK. This man wrote a couple of very powerful books. I can't go into it because of time. But one of the things he did was spoke about this Atlantean re-establishment. Re, re he did it in fictional style. But truth be told is when you study deeper, you understand that he had individuals, because he was part of the Freemasons, he had individuals that he raised who were going to go into the new land and establish or re-establish in his mind and in his understanding the, 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 the Atlantis uh, reality. And so those individuals came over to America. It's not a coincidence that yes, we had the Puritans. Yes, we had all these holy people that came and established Christian principles and values in the new land called America. But it's not a coincidence that they were also deeply versed individuals, well-schooled in the arts of the occult. And if you want to understand this, I'm not making this up. You go study the works of, um, of uh, Helen Blavatsky, Madam Helen Blavatsky, the, the theosophical founder. Study the writings of Manly P. Hall and Albert Pike. These were very powerful individuals in occult circles, very powerful, very influential, highly, highly regarded in society. And what you're going to discover is that they teach about what is called the secret doctrine of America. They teach you about the secret of America and where it came from. So it's no coincidence that there's so much symbolism in the U.S. When they were setting up, they had understood and, and studied deeply something called sacred geometry. They had also deeply understood symbolism, which is where we talk about sigils. Sigils are magical symbols that are used to cast power uh, on, on a given object or a given thing. That's where you get the iconography 
of, of, of these things. So, but sigils are very powerful marks made uh, or written which contain power, which is used to symbolize what they represent in the spiritual realm. And when you look at America and its formation, it is not a coincidence with the eagle, the 13 arrows. It's not a coincidence with the pyramid and the all-seeing eye. All these symbols are deep, deep esoteric symbols. And when you go and study Francis Bacon, you realize that Francis Bacon on the outside looked like a Christian, okay? But he was a very powerful teacher of occult knowledge. If you study theosophy, you realize that theosophy is a blending of occult knowledge. So you've got Hinduism, you've got Buddhism in there, you've got aspects of Christianity, you've got aspects of even Islam. And that's why Baha'i is kind of a birth of that. But what it is, is these teachings were brought behind the scenes and merged to be part of the inner teachings. So, so, so you've got to understand that when you study these things, you see that there is goyim and nosim. So within the establishment, there is the goyim. The goyim are basically the unknowing, the uninitiated. You think you're following Jesus Christ. You think you're following whatever it is you think you're following. Then there's the nosim who know the hidden symbolism. And when Francis Bacon was setting these things up, obviously from his teaching was born what is called the... the, 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 the the faith of the rose or the ro the cross the rose of the the rose the ah, okay i really apologize because i get that name wrong but what it basically comes to is the rose cross and the rose cross formed rosicrucianism and rosicrucianism is is christianity but with a lot of esoteric stuff so that's where you've got the power of numbers the power of symbols the power of dates and days, and moon, and stars, and it's all mixed in there to form very specific means and ways in which things are established. So when you start to study the United States, it's not a coincidence that Washington was picked. And those of you who've studied Washington in an esoteric way, you will see that there are three, two other locations in the world that are important to these very powerful people. And when they were set up, they were set up with a purpose. The other location is the city of London, full of symbolism, full of uh, mystery, and very closed up as well. Did you know that, for example, in the UK, for the Prime Minister to visit the city of London, they need permission from the mayor of the city of London. Very different from the mayor of London. They're not the same. It's a one square mile, very powerful place. And it's completely different. All the powerful corporations of the world have their headship there in that one square mile in London, just after London Bridge. Very powerful place. The same thing also occurs in the Vatican. So you got the Vatican, very powerful, a square mile or two, I don't know, in the middle of Rome, but it's a completely different country with a completely different establishment. The, the, the Pope doesn't even answer to the president or prime minister of Italy. They, it's the Italian minister that answers to the Pope. This is how powerful these places are. So Washington is replete with the symbols. If you, if you look at these three cities from the sky, that's when you can trace all the secret sigils. They are right there. So the people that created these places did them as a setup. They know that these places are going to be key in bringing about the establishment of their goal. What is the goal? And this is where I want to end. What is the goal of this great setup? What's the goal? What's the primary goal? And we'll end there because now we're going to come into the aliens and I'm going to show you how these things all work in the next episode. But what's the goal? Because that's the big, big question. When you ask yourself, when all is said and done, why all this trouble? Why so much secrecy? Why so much work? Answer. Revelation tells us it is the rising of the dragon and his son, the beast. It is the establishing of that reality. So I'm going to end by telling you the story as viewed from the Luciferian angle. 
Why are all these Freemasons, the various orders, these establishments of cities, these powerful, powerful people across the world, why do they go through so much trouble? What's their aim? Answer. They believe that the story of creation and mankind has been twisted by the God of the Bible. So Yah, or Yahweh if you like, is the evil one. In Gnosticism, he's called the Demiurge. So now this Demiurge is the one that messed up humanity. And Lucifer is the good guy. So Lucifer came to bring truth and freedom to the humanity. But then a war ensued between Lucifer and Yah. This is the teaching now in Luciferian circles. So Lucifer's aim and goal has been to bring true, uh, re, re, what, what can I call it, freedom to mankind by showing man his true potential. So all Luciferians believe that actually Lucifer is the true God. When I always tell people that when you hear the saying in God we trust in God this and God that, they don't mean Yah. They don't mean Yahweh. They don't mean, definitely they don't mean his son, uh, Jesus Christ. That's why his name is a swear word. Because it's part of their cursing through Lucifer, who Jesus is. So, their goal and belief is that God, Lucifer, is going to rise and become the great leader of this planet. And so everything they are doing is about setting up his kingdom. And his kingdom will be established on earth. If you followed my series, I already showed you that from the word go, Lucifer rules through proxies. He has not been permitted to rule this world because he has no permission to do so. God intervenes through his mighty angels who keep track and keep watch and ensure that the only people licensed to rule here are ma mankind, human beings. And so Lucifer and their entire group have been at work to bring about the seed of the serpent. That's the whole aim. So bring about the serpentine seed, pollute the bloodline of mankind so that they get to a point where man no longer is man, but is a hybrid. And that's why uh, those who follow me, I talk about homo techno, which is your cyborgs, and finally homo deus which is actually man ascending to godlike status. This is the aim. Because Lucifer knows that that's the best way to rule man through that. And his goal has been since time immemorial to bring about the manifestation of his son, the Antichrist. So everything about this group, the whole setup, and I close with this, the whole aim of the setup is to bring about the establishment of Lucifer's throne on the earth. And they believe with all their heart that this is so. This is why Lucifer rewards those who follow them by giving them power, by giving them all the things that they desire. And in exchange, they give their soul. And I've, I've, I've had a few people argue and say, but souls uh, are spiritual so they can't be given. Yes, they can be traded. And I will get to a teaching in future to show you that souls can be traded and do get traded. And people happily give their souls to the enemy for temporary success on the earth. And this comes at a price. So, closure. The church today is one of the first platforms the enemy now is using powerfully to bring his deception. And one of the methods he's using is ecumenism, but there are many that he's doing. He's brought in a lot of profanity uh, or the profane within the church. And a lot of people do not know this and they embrace these things. And like I told you already, America, as far as I'm concerned, is the risen and revived Babylon or Atlantis. And it will play a very significant role in the end time. Uh, a lot of people usually look at the whole Magog and Gog. and They all have their role to play. But I assure you, the place that will be established as the means to bring about this Antichrist, Antichrist kingdom is going to be the U.S. The U.S. has so much in terms of its setup 
Most of their powerful, powerful members sit there, but it's not just there. They all pay homage to this one spot on the planet, and that's the Vatican. Okay, so that, that's a big thing. So you must take note of that, because there is the Goyim. They know what they're doing. And then there is, the, sorry, there is the Nosim, and they know what they're doing. And the rest are the Goyim, unknowing, uninitiated sheeple going to the slaughter. So my show today has been quite cryptic in many senses, but I had to kind of wrap that up. I had to show you the Atlantean connection. There's so much more to this. If those of you who read and study, go and do a study on this. My next topic, which I'm going to come with, is the great master reset. That's what I'm going to come to. And in the master reset, we're now going to talk about the end times, literally. Like, what are these things that are going to bring about the reset itself? So what is the deception of the end time? And for me, the deception of the end time is the alien angle. Because that, for me, is as profound as it gets. And you see, these demons, these spirits disguised as aliens, whatever you want to call them, know they are not permitted. They know they contend against the, more, the master of the universe. And the master of the universe will never permit their manifestation until the time allotted. And I believe... 100% that one of the reasons this is not going to happen is because of the presence of the church. And it is the reason why people like myself believe in the rapture. Why? Because two reasons. Okay, there are many, but two reasons. Number one, God can never punish the faithful with the wicked. This argument was even raised by Abraham himself when God was about to destroy the same city cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, in the time of the days of Lot, what happened? Abraham said, Lord, if there are 50 righteous people, would you destroy the city? God said, no. He went to 40. He went to 30. He went to 20. I mean, he went down to 10. 10 people. He said, if there are 10 people, God said, for the sake of 10 people, I mean, that's a full city. Probably, maybe there were 50,000 people in that city. We, we don't know, but it was obviously a big city. And, and he said, what if there are 10 people? God said, if there are 10 people, for the sake of the 10, I will not destroy Sodom or Gomorrah. We know that there was only one righteous man, and that was Lot and his family. And because of Lot and his family, the Bible tells us that he had to send angels to go and rescue those two. And the Bible tells me that it was such a challenge. People miss this part. Do you know that Lot kept giving so many excuses why he didn't want to leave the city? Even after men came to the door, banging on the door, wanting to rape the angels or sodomize them, if you like. And even with all that, <laughs> Lot was still struggling with leaving the city. That's how great the city was. And the Bible tells me the angels had to literally grab these guys by their hands and, and drag them out of the city with the daughters. Now think about that. The, the sons didn't even bother. The, the, he dragged them out. And only as they were being dragged out, that's when the destruction of those cities began. I believe in the same way. Those that are faithful, that have been faithful in the church age, because we've got to distinguish there are those who are into dispensationalism. I do believe in some dispensationalism as well. This church age has to end so that the 70th week of Daniel can start. And it is my belief somewhere there. Now, the argument is whether it's pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, I don't know. But the point is somewhere there in that era, God has to remove his church. Why? Because then he can begin the times of the Gentile, oh, sorry, of the of the Jews again. The 70th week that is spoken of in scripture can then take place. So I believe the rapture is the key, that the church must be taken out. And it will come with no announcement, no warning, no real signal. It'll just happen. So I believe that's what it is. That's the first reason. And then the second reason I believe in the rapture is the typology of Joseph. Joseph is a type of Jesus. And the Bible teaches that when it, when it was time for Joseph to reveal himself to his brothers, 
he asked all the people, all the Egyptians to leave. So Gentiles had to leave that room. And he remained alone with his brothers. And that's when he revealed himself. I believe that's a typology of the rapture. Jesus has to identify himself properly to the Jews. Because the Jews are going to fall for the false Messiah, the Antichrist. So in the midst of that incident, when the Antichrist does what is spoken of, the abomination of desolation, at that point, then... Jesus will somehow reveal himself to the Jews when they learn of the great evil that has taken place in their midst. And this whole Jewish scenario is not going to take place with the church there. So the church has to be pulled out. And then the time of the Jews begins. And there will be new people that will get saved, definitely. There will be new people that will believe, definitely. There will even be those who will be slaughtered in that period. And I believe the 144,000 are of Jewish descent. The Bible teaches us that. And when are they killed? In the time of the great tribulation, when the Antichrist is there. 144,000 will be slaughtered. 12,000 from every tribe of, of Israel. So it, how can this happen? Are these spiritual? Are they real? I think they're real. They're real people and God will know who they are, and these will be part of that tribulation. So, in view of all this tapestry, this great deception, it is my view the church is taken out. And so, why am I sharing this information? Because part of that great deception is going to come with the alien connection. You will see uh, in my next episode when I do explain the alien connection. It's, it's some serious stuff. And as far as I'm concerned, it's the most potent way in which man will be deceived. There is nothing that's going to deceive man more powerfully. That's why Hollywood, that great center that churns out propaganda for the work of the enemy, is at work preparing people through all these superhero stories, all these uh, movies that we watch. Entertainment is designed to prime, to prepare, to set in readiness individuals in, in, in the world for the coming great deception so the reset must come and that's what we'll deal with in our next uh presentation it's a heavy presentation there are so many things that i will mention in this one it's it's it's, it's deep and it's something that you want to watch so remember share this with everybody out there uh, let me see if my 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 poll is still there yes it is can it work also i don't know if you guys have been seeing it but if you saw the poll please you can answer it. I was asking about the impact of these presentations. I did not market this one well, so in my next one, I will make sure I do a, a post in advance about this particular era, the deception of the end time, because that's the next topic we're tackling. And I will tell you the aspect, uh, specific date will be probably Monday next week is when I'll present this. So for myself, thank you so much for being part of this, and make sure you share. If you're watching this on uh, YouTube, make sure you actually subscribe to the channel. So have a blessed day and I will certainly catch you tomorrow, uh, on the next transmission.